There it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Jung and Dreams, Introduction, Theory, and Practice. Um, as I'm sure you know, this is the initial free introductory class, and I want to welcome you all to Jung and Dreams. My name is James Newell. Uh, thank you all for registering and uh, for coming today, those of you who are present, and for those of you who are watching the video, thank you for taking the time. We're going to talk about the theory and practice today of Jungian dream interpretation. Uh, as I say, it's an introductory, so we're, there's a lot of kind of basics that we'll have to uh, cover. Uh, but before we do get into talking about the dreams, I do want to say something about uh, just a little description of the Depth Psychology Alliance, a little bit about myself, and how I come to be teaching these courses on Jung, and also a little bit about the, this series of courses. This is number five now in a series we've been doing on Jung and depth psychology. So, the Depth Psychology Alliance. It was founded eight years ago in 2010 by Dr. Bonnie Bright. She wasn't a doctor at the time, but she is now. If you know Bonnie, then you know she's just a wonderful, dynamic person, and uh, we miss her presence here. She was used to be omnipresent, always involved in everything, and she's taken a back seat recently, but she was at the time uh, working on her doctorate at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and she was determined to provide an online resource for spreading information about depth psychology and uh, depth psychology resources. She's very, very passionate about depth psychology, and from the beginning, it was her goal to make depth psychology universally accessible and to help to educate others about the many benefits and insights provided by and through depth psychology and to make those things available and thus the alliance came to be. She worked alone on the Depth Psychology Alliance for about a year and uh, then she began to form an administrative board to help with the logistics of the growing alliance which quickly became uh, from just a few hundred to thousands of people. We now have uh, 5,395 the last time I looked who <coughs> are members, of course not all active but a lot of active members of the DPA who access it either through the, the Depth Psychology site or through the Facebook page. So I was fortunate to become one of the first board members. I uh, joined with Bonnie in uh, 2011, worked with her and the board on Alliance projects for several years. One of the tasks that I was given early on by the Alliance board was to explore putting together a certification program in depth psychology. Working with Body and the board, we put together a number of trial courses, and when um, we complete this course, the Jung and Dreams course, we will have completed the outline for five of the proposed eight courses for the certification program. Uh, after completing her doctorate, Bonnie took on a number of other projects, and eventually last December, she asked if I would be willing to take over the Deaf Psychology Alliance as the executive director. I was a little bit reticent. Uh, Bonnie has been the face of the Alliance for the entire span of its existence, and I have not the energy uh, that Bonnie had uh, or the passion, although I love Deaf Psychology. But I do, uh, I'm invested in it enough that I said yes, and I agreed to take the reins from her, and she's now working on projects of her own, we hope. One day soon, she'll be back uh, working with us more. Uh, in the meantime, I'm, uh, uh, I have a uh, bachelor's degree in psychology from a, well, let me give you a little more background than that. I, I dropped out of high school when I was 15 years old and began playing, I've uh, been a professional musician, musician all my life. I uh, played with a lot of old blues singers, black blues artists, um, John Lee Hooker and uh, Big Joe Turner, who did the original Shake Jet Rattle and Roll, and I uh, toured with uh, the Howlin' Wolf Band and Junior Wells, and I played with Buddy Guy and uh, Hound Dog Taylor and a lot of the old guys. The point, uh, I bring that up because ironically, when I was 40 years old, I decided, well, I was in Nashville, I'd been a songwriter there, not having a whole lot of financial success, and I decided I would uh, get uh, an education I ended up getting a minority scholarship to a black college, Tennessee State University. It's what we call an HBCU, Historically Black College or University. And I got my uh, bachelor's degree in psychology there. I got, uh, I was graduated head of my class and spoke at the commencement and ended up getting a scholarship to Vanderbilt Divinity School where I got a 
degree in pastoral counseling and theology, a master's degree, and then kind of got grandfathered into <clears throat> doing a dissertation for my doctoral work in history of religions. I did a dissertation on the use of music in religious practice. So that's, uh, I was kind of just wrapping that up when I first met Bonnie, and now I've been teaching online, and so it was natural for me to sort of be given the project to develop an online course for the Alliance. So uh, these courses, uh, with this, as I said, is number five, were originally conceived as a way to fulfill the mission of the Alliance and to spread the ideas of depth psychology and to educate others on the importance of depth psychology, while at the same time, uh, we had hoped to help Bonnie meet the financial burden of running the Alliance. And that's still uh, the goal. Uh, the main thing is that it's the mission of the Alliance to educate people, uh, I believe, profoundly, uh, as Bonnie uh, and, and all the board, that depth psychology is very important. Yeah, you really, I uh, won't say any more about it, but all you have to do is turn on the news, any news, and you can see that uh, if we could just get some of these uh, ideas integrated in some of these crazy behaviors that people are having, it could only help. Uh, enough said about that. Um, I want to start with the, this course today that we're introducing is the fifth of a planned series of eight courses that will eventually become the basis for our certification program in depth psychology, which I just mentioned. So far we've had Jung 101, which was an introduction to Jung and Jungian psychology. Jung 102, which is applied Jungian psychology, and we, we started out with these courses based on surveys and things that we did finding out what would people really want, because we want to, well, we have our mission, but it's no good unless other people want it. So we found that people did want an introduction to Jung, then everybody in that course wanted to, it's very successful, and they've all been uh, very well received, I'm very pleased to say. The applied uh, Jungian psychology course came about because people uh, the first one was mostly theory. People wanted to know more, well, how do I use this? What are the techniques? So we had a, a 102 course on applied Jungian psychology. Then we did Jungian alchemy, which seems a little out of sync, and it was, but again, did surveys. People wanted Jungian alchemy. We did that uh, last winter, uh, last fall, and last spring we presented Jungian mythology. After the completion of the Dreams course, which will be starting next week, the remaining courses will be uh, an introduction to depth psychology, which we hope to do in January, well, maybe late January, mid-February. Uh, Jung and fairy tales will follow that, and then Jung and active imagination, and that will be all eight courses for the certification. Uh, our plan is to present each course live. That gives us a sense to get the feedback and to uh, work with people on the course and just see what works and, and what people want more of and all of that. Uh, but then to move them all onto a video on demand platform that will allow people to learn at their own pace when and as they have time, then students who successfully complete all eight courses will not only have received a detailed and comprehensive education in depth psychology. And that, to me, that's the important part. This isn't, to me, this isn't about providing a credential. The credential isn't as meaningful as uh, I think, I know there are people on this call and, and, uh, you can you can ask around, but a lot of people have taken these courses, and you really, if you if you want to apply yourself, and you really are interested in learning, and you don't have a lot of background, even if you have some background, you will learn a lot about Jung and about depth psychology through these courses, and that's the main thing that the the way I uh, sort of see the credential and the the program itself working for people is that if you are in the field, uh, mainstream acad uh, academia does not provide depth psychology education anywhere, except on the West Coast, there's three or four very good schools, and I want to stress there are excellent schools available that teach depth psychology. However, they're also very, very expensive. If you if you are a licensed practitioner or someone who's, who's doing this kind of work, but have never really had any kind of training, this is an ideal kind of credential to add to your CV. And uh, it's not on its own, it's not going to be as valuable as it would be as an adjunct to people who've got some training, maybe got licensure, uh, want to do the work, people who are coaches, things like that, who would like to have this additional background, that's, this is for you. That's what we're trying to uh, design it for so that people will, will have a, an economical 
uh, in-depth quality education about deaf psychology. So uh, you'll not only receive comprehensive education, but you'll also receive a certificate identifying you as a certified, certified specialist in depth psychology. That's the plan. Uh, we still got more to do. Uh, I hope, I'm hoping by January, uh, maybe February, to have at least Jung 101, possibly Jung 102 as well, uh, in video format. Uh, okay, that's enough about that. Now let's, there's a lot, needless to say, there's a lot to cover. Even an eight-week course on uh, Jung and Dreams is not enough to cover everything. So certainly uh, an hour or so is not going to be enough to cover everything. But uh, I don't want to rush so quickly that uh, you can't follow what I'm saying, and I hope I haven't done that. But I, I also I want this to be kind of jam-packed so you really feel like you, yeah, there's a lot here of value. Uh, that will be particularly useful. Uh, if you do miss something, uh, I think the video, which will be freely available uh, on the Depth Alliance site, and also anybody registered for this class, uh, will send you a link to it. So you can come back and find the spots that you want to uh, review, because maybe it, it uh, went by a little too quickly, or you were focusing on something else. So in order to, I want to start now on, that's my intro. Now I want to tell you what I can quickly about Jungian dream interpretation. In order to understand Jung's approach to dreams, we have to know something about Jung's view of the psyche. Now, if you've taken my courses before, you already have some background. If you haven't, then uh, this will hopefully ground you a little bit in where we're coming from, why Jung thought the way he did, why he developed the techniques he did. And you will also find, I think, that some of this is, is familiar because Jung died in 1961. He is slowly, slowly, even though people in the academic world and, and uh, mainstream psychology do not tend to uh, accept Jung and give him the credit that he deserves, they use his ideas and they change, they call it something else. And uh, so a lot of these things are out there now because Jung has been working on this since uh, more than 100 years uh, from now. Uh, his work has been out there, so it's it's seeped slowly into the culture. Still, uh, I hope to put it in context in a way that you'll be able to understand it. I hear something back there. <clears throat> uh, again, if you can uh, mute your yourselves, um, that will help. So naturally, um, I hope that if you find this compelling, that you'll go ahead and sign up for the course, but even if you don't, I think uh, learning some of this will be helpful to, and it will help to further the mission of the Alliance, which is to, to get these ideas out there. So an important thing to understand about Jung's work and why it's not so widely accepted is that in the 19th century, people like William James and other psychologists, William James is known as a philosopher, but he also was uh, one of the first certainly the first uh, very well-known uh, American psychologist. Uh, he wrote a wonderful, huge collection of writings called The Principles of Psychology. And during that period, introspection, William James said that the our first and foremost technique is always introspection. Well, this was completely opposite to what soon became the norm in academic psychology, which is, uh, we now know, if you read Jung, you'll see he, he often will speak derisively about academic psychology, what he calls academic psychology. That's, we would call it today behaviorism. Uh, out of behaviorism has come uh, cognitive behaviorism, and a lot of, there's a lot of value there, but they do not put value on introspection. So uh, I'm gonna leave it at that for now, as we get into in the course when we talk about um, the neuroscientific approach to dreams and the uh, dream science, that people are working on now, we'll see how Jung, through introspection, discovers many of the same principles and things that neuroscientists have uh, discovered through their techniques, which are what we would call objective science. They eschew Jung by saying that his introspective techniques are subjective and not scientific, but part of Jung's genius is that he was able to take introspective observations and make them empirical and make them scientific. Uh, we won't go into detail about that now, but it's good to keep that in mind that 
introspection was a key to his technique of work. Jung believed that there was a structured psyche. Uh, we won't go into all the details of the structure, but we, uh, you can see this di diagram over here to the right. This uh, doesn't have all the constituents, but many of the constituents of how he saw the psyche as being structured. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. Through these structures flowed and flow uh, what he called psychic energy. Of course, people know, people tend to think, oh, Jung was a student of Freud. He wasn't a student of Freud, they were colleagues. Freud was older than him, but uh, they had a very, very close collegial relationship. Freud, who of course uh, did do his work previous to Jung, being older, uh, called psychic energy, what Jung calls psychic energy, he called it libido. Now libido has come to be identified with Freud and with the idea that it's always sexual. Freud's idea was that psychic energy always at root was sexual. Jung said, no, no, there's, there's hunger drives, there's religious drives, there's uh, dominance and submission drives. It's not all uh, about sex, although sex is, ab he absolutely was on board with and uh, certainly affirmed that sex is an important drive that has to always be even at the forefront of what when we're considering the unconscious and all these things however not the only thing so he uh used the word psychic energy not psychic like you call the psychic hotline and psychic simply means of the psyche so psychic energy and how it flows through the structured psyche is an important part of jung's idea of the psyche and how and why he used the techniques of dreams that he did. Another thing that, the main thing that separates Jung from uh, Freud and from most every other depth psychologist, and as I said, there's academic psychology, which pays very little behaviorism, which pays very little, if any, attention to the unconscious. They kind of deny that there's even such a thing as the unconscious because it's so mercurial and hard to pin down. But even among deaf psychologists, what Freud would call, for example, the unconscious or the uh, Jung basically called the personal unconscious. Uh, he, Freud um, had a, an idea that he called underneath the, the unconscious was the id, which is all the drives of uh, instincts and, of course, primarily the sexual drive and the pleasure principle of just seeking pleasure all the time. That's what came from what Freud called the id. For Jung, however, not only was the, their not only were there structures in the personal unconscious, but there was a highly structured collective unconscious. And the constituents of the personal unconscious are the complexes, according to Jung, and the constituents of the collective unconscious are the archetypes. And again, we're gonna say more of this as we go along. So uh, we can't overstate, particularly in dream work, the importance of the complex or the complexes. Uh, we tend to think that a complex is something never negative. We say, oh, he has a complex, he has a mother complex, or uh, she has a real complex about that. But everybody has complexes. The ego is a complex, according to Jung. The persona is a complex. Everybody has a mother complex. Everybody, Even if you were an orphan and didn't have a mother or father, you still have a mother complex, uh, which is projected onto the uh, whoever the primary caregiver was when you were an infant. So again, I won't go too much into, I'm going to say a lot more about complexes as we go along, but particularly in understanding Jungian dream interpretation, the complex is very, very important. We'll say more about that. In fact, Jung says, and I'll refer to this again, the royal road to the unconscious he says, is not the dream, as Freud thought. Freud was famous for saying in his book, Interpretation of Dreams, he said the via riga to the unconscious, the royal road to the unconscious was the dream. Jung says, not the dream, but the complex is the royal road to the unconscious. He says the complex is the architect of dreams and of symptoms. So he's not downplaying the dream as being the royal road. He's saying that the main constituent of the dream, the main thing we're looking at that we want to sort of pull apart, tease apart, and make conscious is the complex, which is the architect of the dream and of the symptoms that we as a neurotic or 
whatever our particular issue is that we're working on. It's the complex that is the architect of those symptoms. So for Jung, the goal of analysis or therapy, and uh, in that sense, the goal of dream work, is to establish an ongoing relationship between the conscious and unconscious systems of the psyche. He called this the process of individuation, and this development of relationship between the conscious and unconscious systems is also the goal of Jungian dream work. So that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell. Obviously, there's, there's much more to it, and I'm going to try and go into that. So individuation, what is that? Individuation is the word that Jung used to describe the differentiation of the conscious ego from the unconscious self, and that's self with a capital S, meaning the archetypal self, means the, the whole uh, uh, constituency of the archetypes leads back to this primary center of the organism, uh, particularly the center of the uh, central nervous system, what Jung called the archetype of the self. As Jung says, the aim of individuation is nothing less than to divest the self, and there's a small s self, means divesting the uh, personality self, of the false wrappings of the persona on the one hand, and of the suggestive power of primordial images, i.e. archetypes, on the other hand. So I don't want to be uh, driven by my need to please others, which is the persona, and I also don't want to be driven by the drives in the form of the primordial archetypal drives of the unconscious. And as I uh, divest myself, as he says, of these false wrappings, uh, I become an individual who still has a connection both with the social group outside and with what you might call the social group or the, uh, the objective psyche, as Jung called it, the, the deep levels of the unconscious or the archetypal self. And that's from Collected Works, uh, The Function of the Unconscious. So uh, you can see this is, now this is a metaphor. This is a, a um, diagram of the Jungian psyche. If we cut open a human's brain, we will not find an ego or a persona or any of these things. The, again, Jung, this is one of the problems that scientists have with Jung. They, they, they say, well, show me where's, this, where's the persona? Where's the ego? Where do I find these things? How can I cut open the brain and find them? Jung uh, identifies these things, and Freud uh, before him identified these things through their work with the unconscious. And their work with the unconscious was primarily dream images. <clears throat> so they construct a structured psyche. Um, for Freud, there was a structure to the conscious and you might call subconscious or just the unconscious insofar as it had uh, personal traits there and complexes, although he, uh, when he broke with Jung, he threw out the word complex. But for Jung, there was structure deep, deep in the psyche in the same way that we have structured bones in our hands that are similar. My, the structure of the bones in my hand is similar to the structure of most other people's bones in their hands. Likewise, the deep unconscious also has similar structures. You have a similar structure in your deep unconscious to mine, etc., etc. In the development of personality, we develop a persona, which helps us to interact with the social group. This is this little line around the outside. This circle here represents metaphorically, as I say, consciousness. The center of consciousness is the ego which processes uh, what William James called the stream of consciousness. Below, and only sometimes accessible to the ego, is the personal unconscious, which carries all our personal memories, uh, things if I put my keys down, I don't remember where they are, but sometimes I can retrieve the memory and say, oh, that's right, I left them on the counter. <clears throat> there are all those different levels of, un even uh, things that happened uh, in early childhood that uh, I don't, always remember, but with some work with therapy and what have you, I can dredge up. Uh, that's in the personal unconscious. But this archetype of the self, which um, Jung would say certainly on a biological level is the center of the organism, regulates breathing, heartbeat, all that kind of thing, and also appears in the psyche when we do introspective work, appears in various guises that are usually religious in nature. Uh, 
we don't always, we rarely, I should say, experience the archetype of the self directly. It's a, it's an extraordinarily, uh, it can be, it can cause a psychosis in someone who does not have a strong ego. For someone with, with an extraordinarily strong ego, it would be experienced as a, a religious experience. And throughout history, according to Jung, when people encounter the self, they record the encounter as a religious experience. But uh, usually it's more fragmented. We, we encounter littler archetypes, not just the archetype of the self. We encounter the archetype of the warrior, the archetype of the mother, archetype of the father, the king, uh, those kind of things. So uh, when we develop as children, we, this is mainly this diagram. This is from both of these. Well, no, actually the previous one wasn't, but this one is from uh, Esther Harding's book, The I and the Not I, which I highly recommend especially for this sort of uh, the structures of the psyche that Jung describes. Uh, as a child, we grow up and we have these latent uh, archetypal structures in us. And when we encounter a person in the out outer world, say this one up at the right is, is our mother. We have a mother archetype internally, which we then project it. Uh, it's a Jungian called Anthony Stevens, who says there's an archetypal intent there's a, in the sense, you could say an acorn intends to grow up to be an oak tree. But for that to happen, there has to be a certain quality of soil. There has to be a certain amount of sunlight. There has to be certain uh, minerals in the soil. There has to, certain factors have to be met. Likewise, in a person, there's an intent. There's an archetypal intent, the mother archetype. And the child is born expecting to be nourished, expecting to suckle at the mother's breast, expecting all these various things in the environment, and each time we encounter one, in other words, the deep unconscious is not a blank slate, as some would have us say. Jung said, no, there are structures which are waiting, and this has been shown, I won't go into too much detail here, but it's been shown by ethologists, it's been shown by uh, people, ethologists are those who work with uh, animals and instincts, why do the swallows go to Capistrano, why does a certain type of tortoise, uh, when hatched from eggs in the sand, dash to the sea before it knows anything. It knows to dash to the sea. How does that happen? Well, there's an archetypal intent. There's a, uh, they call it in ethology, an innate response mechanism. Uh, these uh, correspond to what Jung called the archetypes. There's an expectation of something in the outer world. It, uh, when uh, we encounter it in the outer world as a child, it activates those archetypes. Now, if we don't encounter them or we encounter some negative uh, aspect of it, then we end up having a difficult time in development. Uh, we won't go into too much detail with that now. What I want to do is emphasize that these things, the, the deep archetypal structures of them would dwell down here in the collective unconscious, and then the complexes would dwell in the personal unconscious. We uh, This diagram isn't complete. It would be pretty crowded if we added more things, but here in the collective unconscious, we'd have the archetypes. The only archetype it has here now is the self. And then we would have complexes here. And I'll, again, I'll say more about complexes as we go along. Now, uh, Jung points to the myth of the hero. Uh, he first made this connection in his book. It was originally published as Psychology of the Unconscious in, I think, 1913, something like that. Uh, but eventually he rewrote it. Um, updated it in the 50s and called it symbols of transformation but in that book he points to the myth of the hero as a way to illustrate the tendency of the ego to descend into the unconscious in order to access the libido i.e the psychic energy <clears throat> remember libido for freud is, is purely sexual sexual jung would still sometimes use the word libido but he prefers psychic energy because it didn't have that association of being exclusively sexual but we need psychic energy. We need energy to accomplish the tasks that we have in the world in order to be generative, in order to take care of our families and our communities. We need access to this psychic energy. And the psychic energy is mediated to the ego through the archetypes. And although we do not have a conscious uh, connection directly with the archetypes, we do have... Oh, my goodness. It's thunder and lightning here. I'll find it. Sorry? I'll find it. That's somebody unmuted. Please mute, mute no. it. No, no, the, the, the crash you just heard was th thunder coming from my microphone. There's, oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, uh, can't mute me. I'll be uh, in trouble. Um, 
but yeah, it's thundering here. I, I know people uh, were with us, uh, I think it was, must have been two years ago when Hurricane Matthew came through. We had to actually cancel yeah. the class because the hurricane came in the middle of the class. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully that uh, we don't expect any hurricanes today, but these days mm -hmm. you just don't know. We've had enough. So, haven't we? Yeah. So, but I am talking about psychic energy being mediated by the archetypes and the uh, lightning strikes. So I don't know about that. In any case. Uh, the we don't encounter the archetype directly. We encounter it through the archetypal image or the symbol. The symbol is the mediator of energy to the ego. Uh, and again, I'll say more about that. This is why symbols and dreams are so important. As we can access them in a healthy way, we make these archetypal energies available to us for the work we're trying to accomplish in the world. Just getting up, taking care of the kids going to our job, doing the important things we have to do. We can only do that if we can access these uh, energies that, that are there in everyone. So Eric Neumann, a wonderful student of Jung, says, in the process of realizing and assimilating an unconscious content, the ego makes a descent from the conscious standpoint into the depths in order to raise up the treasure. This is another reference to this hero myth. And uh, the hero, <clears throat> of course, with the metaphorical treasure brings this psychic energy and makes it available to consciousness. So we've mentioned the, the idea of the hero's journey. It was uh, first, uh, not Jung wasn't the first one to talk about it, certainly the first one to talk about it in this way. Uh, and then very soon after him, uh, Joseph Campbell came out with his book. Uh, the, he'd read Symbols of Transformation and uh, wrote his book, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And from that, we get this whole uh, mythology of the hero as uh, laid out by Campbell. You're in the ordinary world. There's a call to adventure, perhaps a refusal of the call, meeting of a mentor and a descent down into crossing the threshold, encountering tests and allies, approaching the deep, deep uh, innermost cave. There's some sort of ordeal, a death and rebirth. There's some kind of reward. This is the psychic energy which is seized and brought back up to the ordinary world. There's a resurrection, a return with the elixir of life, a turn with this psychic energy, and uh, the cycle begins again. And I will say more about this. The development, uh, the, the, the idea, as I'd said earlier, in Jungian psychology is to bring this psychic energy up, have a, it's, it's in the archetypes, we want to have a communic. We must have a communication with the unconscious. If we don't, we're either dissociated, or the unconscious itself will possess us. Will become possessed by an archetype, and uh, be, go into a manic state. And be in either case, we're not really in touch with reality. But if we can develop this ego self axis, this is a uh, phrase that was coined by Eric Neumann and used uh, to great effect. Um, by Edward Edinger in his book, Ego and Archetype, and that's where this diagram comes from. So when the ego is not fully developed, it's completely encased in the self, it's in a state of what Jung called participatio and mystique, or participation, uh, mystical participation. And just complete everything, we don't really see anything real out there, we're only experiencing the archetype, that projection that I was showing you earlier. But as we become more and more we, we make more and more of that psychic energy available to the ego. Uh, then the ego differentiates itself a little bit more from the self, a little bit more from the self, becomes more and more conscious until it becomes uh, in a state of communication with the deep self, but still uh, understands itself to be separate uh, from the self. What makes now, it become more conscious, James? What makes it more conscious? Yeah, what makes it become more conscious? Well, that's the work that we do. That's that we go through the hero's journey, uh, going to the descent, and we. And I'll, I'm going to expand on this in a minute when we okay. look at this. Is another this is another way of looking at the hero's journey. This is another one from editor and ego and archetype. So I'm going to put this now. See, with the hero's journey, we're talking completely metaphorically. Now we're talking about uh, how we understand it psychologically. So we're in a state of wholeness. We're in a state of just normal, uh, say we're, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, say we're in, in, in this state here. We're just a little bit, we're, you know, we're maybe uh, adolescent stage. We're a little bit conscious, a little bit driven by the unconscious. So then we, uh, let me see. there we go. So then that's, that's a, a state of somewhat wholeness. 
But as we do that, the uh, ego becomes identified with at some phase in that the ego is identified with the self and thinks I am the great uh, archetypal king. I am, I am the great, uh, the, say the, if I was a, I was saying, for example, that that's a teenager, well, then I would say, I'm, I'm, I am the puer eternus. I'm the eternal youth. Everything I do is beautiful and magical and wonderful. This is an active inflation because I'm identified with this archetype of the puer. And because I'm identified with it and I'm inflated, I do some inflated or heroic act. But because I'm not in touch with reality, I stub mm -hmm. my toe or I fall into a hole. And, uh, and I've rejected I tell, I, I go to some girl and I say, I am the great Puerto Turner. Don't you love me? Mom loves me. You must love me. She oh. says, get out of here, buddy. <laughs> and uh, he experiences the rejection. Holy mackerel. If I'm the great Puerto Turner, why is she rejecting me? So then he has to, he's now feeling an alienation. If all that energy that he was inflated with is dissipated and he is no longer got any contact to that energy. He's feeling nothing but alienation from that, uh, electrical charge of psychic energy he feels complete humility he repents how could i be so stupid i thought i was great i really wasn't great at all he accepts that uh, sense of alienation and realizes yeah i need to i need to be more in touch with reality he reconnects with who he really is with the limitations that he has and or she and began then he experiences what we call passive inflation where he has now an authentic uh, this is the, the part where he becomes more conscious because he has an authentic sense of who he really is. And he's filled with the joy of knowing, ah, finally, this is real. Now I, I can, you know, put my feet on the ground and say, yeah, I'm not the great poor returnist. I got some energy. I can do some good things. Some people like me. Some people don't like me so much. But if I work hard, I can do good things. So he's become more conscious. And because of that, uh, he becomes uh, a little bit more conscious. That's you know, the question was, how does he become more conscious? How does one, how does she become more conscious? By going through that hero journey, going through that sense of uh, isolation, alienation, and realizing that I'm no longer inflated with the, my own greatness. I, I'm not identified with the archetype. I go through the experience of being alienated from the archetype, but then I reconnect. I get some energy and I become a little bit more conscious. And the idea is to become more and more conscious and learn the process, the ongoing regulation of this archetypal energy, when I can re regulate the grandiose energies that are radiating off of the deep unconscious. Uh, and through centuries and centuries and centuries, human beings have done that through religious practice. They, they project these archetypal energies onto a deity, they bow in reverence to the deity, and through that, they are able to regulate this grandiose energy. They can say, no, I am not the grandiose energy. The deity has the grandiose energy, and they are uh, connected to it in that way and the One danger of, for our time would be that we don't have that projection we're not able to project to that exactly or if we do when we when we when we no longer when the religion no longer works for us we say well uh i'm a democrat and the democrats are the gods of the universe right or or i'm a republican and the republican and then you know then then you have this divisive uh fighting against each other because you can't have two gods without the gods fighting got it so yeah, and uh, yeah, we, I should have probably brought in my little uh, die. It's another Edinger diagram that kind of shows that phase, which I don't have that here because we're going to have to jump into dreams some more. So the dangers we face on the hero's journey emerge when we fail to face and deal with the challenges arising from the unconscious. When we fail to develop the skills involved in managing our complexes through establishing a dialogue with the unconscious. We risk falling prey to either, as I just said, identification with archetypal energies, which causes anxiety. Those of you who are uh, work in psychology, you know the DSM-4, there's anxiety disorders and there's depressive disorders. Uh, if, if you have an anxiety disorder, almost certainly a Jungian would say that your problem is identification with an archetype. And that can even be an unconscious identification. If, you're, if you think I'm the lowest thing in the world, that's also a form of inflation and can cause anxiety. Uh, so you're either identified with archetypal energies or you're completely alienated from the archetypal energies. And when you're alienated, you're depressed because you have no energy, you can't do anything, nothing works for you, uh, and it's, everything is, is bad. The other side is uh, I'm filled, puffed up with the archetypal energies. Uh, 
So either of these states, identification or alienation, can lead to a host of diagnosable neuroses. Dialoguing with and remaining in communication with the unconscious through dream work. Now, it's, I am talking about dreams, even though I'm bringing in all this Jungian theory. It's through dream. Dream work is the primary way that we uh, work with the unconscious and get reconnected with the unconscious uh, to help us uh, avoid either being identified and inflated by the energies or being completely alienated from them and depressed by that. So um, dialoguing with and remaining in communication with the unconscious through dream work can help us to learn how to regulate and steward powerful archetypal energies. If we do not learn how to do so, we may either become identified with these energies and think we are in control of them when we're really not, we're just possessed by them, or we become alienated from our own life energies and fall into a depression. So now I mentioned early in that little uh, pontification <laughs> that uh, uh, complexes were uh, sort of the route through which that energy travels to the ego. Uh, before we begin, our uh, little review uh, of what we'll be covering in the eight-week Jung and Dreams course, which I want to close with. I want to say a little bit about complexes because they're so key, particularly in uh, working with dreams. So I want to return for a moment to that quote that I mentioned earlier from Jung, where he says, the royal road to the unconscious is not the dream, as Freud thought, but the complex, which is the architect of dreams and of symptoms. So you can see from that statement, uh, complexes are extremely important for Jung. Now that quote and the following quote were both from Jung's 1934 essay, A Review of the Complex Theory. And I'm going to quote a little bit from that because I think it's important for us to hear Jung's voice and to see is a very succinct way that he describes complexes. And then I'll share with you a somewhat more, uh, more compact uh, definition. So this is Jung's voice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everyone knows nowadays that people have complexes. What is not so well known, though far more important theoretically, is that complexes can have us. The existence of complexes throws serious doubt on the naive assumption of the unity of consciousness, which is equated with psyche, and on the supremacy of the will. In other words, he's saying it throws doubt on the fact, that, on the idea that we even have. Uh, a free will. Every constellation of a complex postulates a disturbed state of consciousness. And when he says constellation, he means an activation. A complex becomes, uh, essentially, I become possessed. One minute I'm talking like a, a normal guy. It's a big gathering of people, a bunch of couples around, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm being just a normal guy, and then all of a sudden I start screaming at my wife. Well, what the hell? What was that? You know, what? how did that happen? Well, the person, I or whoever is experiencing this, has uh, become, uh, a, a complex has been constellated or activated in me, and, and it's no longer me. It's no longer the me that I know. It's now the complex speaking. The unity of consciousness, I'm back to, this is Jung's words, the unity of consciousness is disrupted, and the intentions of the will are impeded or made impossible. Even memory is often noticeably affected as we have seen. The complex must therefore be a psychic factor which, in terms of energy, possesses a value. This is very important. The, the complex possesses an energy value that sometimes exceeds that of our conscious intentions. In other words, my ego has only so much psychic energy, and the complex, because it's been buried, it's been repressed, it's actually got more energy than my ego, and I, my ego just doesn't have the strength to hold it back. The energy of the complex overwhelms my intention, and uh, such disruptions of the conscious order would not be possible at all if that were not so, he's saying. So uh, that's one section of just explaining how the energy, this, this is why I mentioned psychic energy earlier, because it's where the energy flows, and when the complex has more energy than my conscious will, the complex can is in great, great danger of taking over. And uh, people say, well, what happened to so-and-so? He seems like such a nice guy that he took a, a, a gun and went and started shooting people. Well, I can at least say that a Jungian would claim there's a complex involved there. I would say a warrior complex that's you know completely off the rails, but 
that's not our task to get into that today. So from the same essay, uh, I want to quote another uh, paragraph where Jung makes sort of a more technical definition of the complex. So Jung says, what then, scientifically speaking, is a feeling-toned complex? It is the image of a certain psychic situation which is strongly accentuated emotionally and is, moreover, incompatible with the habitual attitude of consciousness. This image has a powerful inner coherence, that is to say it has its own autonomous inner coherence. It, it's, it works within its own center, which is not the center of consciousness. This image has a powerful inner coherence. It has its own wholeness and, in addition, a relatively high degree of autonomy so that it is subject to the control of the conscious mind to only a limited extent and therefore behaves like an animated foreign body in the sphere of consciousness. The complex can usually be suppressed with an effort of will, but not argued out of existence. And at the first suitable opportunity, it reappears in all its original strength. And uh, you often hear about this, perhaps a man who highly functioning at work. He's uh, always uh, you know, on the go. He's doing great things. Everybody loves him at work. Then he goes home and he beats his wife. Well, what happened? Well, he had suitable energy focused on this survival skill of, of uh, working in the world, but uh, the complex did not go away. When he got home, uh, he, there's a phrase they use, decompensates. He decompensates a little bit, and all of a sudden, the complex has more energy than his conscious will and he behaves in a way that he would normally never behave. Well, that's not to excuse the behavior, but it's to say that complexes take over. So this is a somewhat simpler, uh, more succinct definition of the, the complex by a wonderful uh, Jungian analyst who recently passed away from Tel Aviv, uh, Errol Shalit. He says, complex denotes a network of associations images, ideas, memories, or the like, clustered around a nuclear archetypal core of meaning and characterized and held together by a common emotional tone. Thus, the complex embodies three elements, an archetypal core. Now, see, this is a vital point for what we're talking about, the way energy flows. The archetypal core of the complex is where all the energy is bound up. And if the complex is suitably autonomous and not integrated, then that energy is gonna only be accessible when we're in the grip of the complex. So the complex embodies three elements, an archetypal core around which personal experiences cluster. In other words, uh, it'll, be relate, it'll be triggered by, and it'll be related to some, usually a personal trauma, perhaps an early trauma, or just some system of experiences that got wrapped around that archetypal core. And it has, as a result, an emotional tone that serves as the gravitational force that holds this microcosm together. So personal experiences, archetypal core, all tied together with this particular emotional tone. That's what a complex is. And the point of the complexes is that uh, they are personified in dreams. I'm saying the point in our uh, interest today in dreams is that it's the complexes that we see personified in the dreams. So looked at in this way, the complex is like an onion. As we work on complexes, we peel away one layer at a time until we get to the core. From this perspective, we'll first encounter symptoms. I'm acting out in some way. Maybe I'm compulsive. Maybe I, I do something again that's uh, not my conscious intention. The energy of the complex has more energy than my own conscious intention. So I'll first encounter symptoms, uh, then I'll, ex I'll remember or, or kind of tease out from the symptoms personal experiences. There'll be associations often related to an early trauma. And then if I can stay with it, do the work, I will find there an archetypal core. In other words, a common human experience that I'm not the first person that's been in the grip of this complex. There's an archetypal pattern that throughout history, human beings over and over and over again have had a similar uh, experience of this complex in different ways throughout history. That's the archetypal core. This is why we look for parallels and things in dreams when we're uh, 
uh, working on them. So this is another way of looking at the onion. You have the surface system on the symptoms on the outside. You have the associated experiences as you work on it. And then there's an archetypal core. So now that we've reviewed a little bit a uh, survey of some of the key elements of Jung's theory and the role of dream work in facilitating the process of individuation. In other words, we want to make that connection to the deep unconscious, keep that, art, that ego self access energy flowing. In order to do that, we need to go through or deal with in one way or another, the complexes. So uh, how do we do that? Well, we start with the dream. It's the key uh, technique of Jungian psychology and all, basically all other techniques flow uh, out of that in some way or another through, I would say, the rubric of active imagination. But uh, now I want to just focus on uh, how do we get to technique? How do we get to actually applying these ideas in a way that's practical for our own dreams and working with the dreams of others? It's a little bit tricky because Jung was not in favor of systematizing his work. He always preferred to be in the moment and to only apply techniques that responded to the specific case that he was considering. Even so, uh, he did offer many suggestions for a successful dream interpretation. And as he says in regard to interpreting dreams, uh, intuition was a key thing. And he says, no experienced worker in this field will deny that there are rules of thumb that can prove helpful, but they must be applied with prudence and intelligence. Not everybody can master the, quote, technique. You may follow all the right rules and the apparently safe path of knowledge, and yet you get stuck in the most appalling nonsense simply by overlooking a seemingly unimportant detail that a better intelligence would not have missed. Even a man with a highly developed intellect can go badly astray because he has never learned to use his intuition or his feeling, which might be at a regrettably low level of development. So you can see that Jung, uh, and this is something I've talked about elsewhere at length, but for Jung, intelligence does not mean a dissociated, incredible, rational intellect. It means, it, it, what now, it's very popular to talk about emotional intelligence, but that's Jung. Jung's Copernican revolution is to say that real consciousness, real intelligence must be connected to the deep levels of the unconscious, must be connected to the emotions, must include all of the four functions. Uh, and I'm not going to get into typology and functions, but when he says really, truly intelligent, he means that the intuition is integrated, feeling function is integrated, and sensation is integrated with the intellect. So, uh, in the same passage, Jung goes on to say, this is the uh, Collected Works, uh, volume 18. Intuition is almost indispensable in the interpretation of symbols and can cause an immediate acceptance on the part of the dreamer. And Jung always, when talking about dreams, says it doesn't matter what you think, what the therapist thinks, what anybody else thinks. It's always the important thing is what does the dreamer connect with? If it resonates with the dreamer, then it's important. So, but one can understand and explain only when one has brought intuitions down to the safe basis of real knowledge of the facts and their logical connections. In other words, he's saying there has to be sort of a blending of the head and the heart. There has to be a blending of intellect and feeling, intellect and intuition, and a sense of the body and the whole integrated, hopefully individuated, uh, self has to encounter the dream. That's how we interpret them best. So even a basic how-to of Jungian dream interpretation must be viewed with some suspicion since for Jung, each case must be examined individually and in the context of the situation, the dreamer's life, and a host of other factors. So with these caveats in mind, I'd like to take a look at some accepted rules of thumb as a starting point for approaching the interpretation of dreams in a way that Jung might feel is acceptable. Of course, there's the, the sort of basic uh, rule that you need to have the intention that you're going to, for example, uh, if I say, well, I don't have any dreams and that's that, I uh, probably won't have any dreams. But if I put a, a notebook next to my bed and a pen and I write down any image I get, anything, or if I don't get anything, I write down in the morning, did not get any dream, hope I get a dream tomorrow. Put the notebook aside, go about my business. When we take the unconscious seriously, the unconscious will respond. And we can do that ourselves or tell that to people we work with. But 
it's this whole process. Even if you just read a book, uh, Jung, one of Jung's books on dreams, you will tend to have more dreams. Uh, it's, it, taking a class like this sometimes, uh, just paying attention to and beginning to take the unconscious consciously, uh, seriously, will uh, help to stimulate things. So that's a general rule, but uh, here's some, some, again, rules of thumb. So James Hall's 1983 book, Jungian Dream Interpretation, a Handbook of Theory and Practice, published by Any City, City Books, uh, provides an excellent place to begin thinking about Jungian dream interpretation. In some ways, Hall's book is a kind of cliff notes introduction to many of the basics of Jungian dream work. So according to Hall, there are three major steps in the Jungian approach to dream interpretation. First, a clear understanding of the exact details of the dream. In other words, uh, as soon as possible, as soon you know, before dreams are very mercurial things, they will slip away. We write them down, write down, but take the time, be serious enough to really get all the details and communicate them to whomever you are working with, or if you're working alone, make sure you get as much of it down as you can. Then, uh, reading through the dream, we gather as many associations. That means, oh, I, that, that reminds me of my mother, that reminds me of uh, something that happened back uh, when I was a kid, etc. That's Those are associations. Amplifications, which is a key element of dream interpretation, is when we uh, bring in a fairy tale that has a similar pattern or a similar motif. We bring in a, uh, a myth, a, a religious uh, a story from a religious text or something. And we, we say, oh, well, in, there's this pattern in my dream, there's this pattern in that story, and in the story, such and such happens. I wonder if that relates to my dream. So we bring in amplifications, we bring in associations, and we do so in a progressive order from one or more of three levels. First level, the personal level, we make associations between memories, thoughts, friends, people, cultural associations, uh, what's going on in, in the world today, in my ethnic or my cultural or my general milieu, my work environment perhaps. And then again, the application, which is the archetypal level, which we'd find in fairy tales or alchemy or mythology, etc. All of Jung's interests and all those other things were essentially uh, ways to help him access these deep patterns and, and mainly to work better with his clients so that he could work and understand their dreams and fantasies and active imaginations uh, more accurately in a way that was more helpful to them to do what to achieve this uh, individuation process that uh, we were describing earlier. So the placing of the amplified dream in the context of the dreamer's life situation is the next step. And in the context of, as I said, the process of individuation, what, what does this say to the issues I've been working on? What does this say to where I feel I am in the process of individuation? There's a lot more to say about individuation, which I won't have time to go into. Um, but this, this is a basic sort of list of how I would work with, how we would, if we want to work in a Jungian way, uh, work with a dream is to write these things down, gather these associations, and then try to apply them to where we feel we are in uh, space and time in the development of our uh, individuation process. So uh, quickly now, because I want to allow as much time as anybody wants for uh, questions, discussion, comments, what have you, uh, I want to just go through uh, what I hope to be uh, the plan for the eight-week course. So, of course, we've, we've outlined some of the basics of Jung's theory, the basics of the structure of the Jungian psyche, how the energy moves through the system, and the process of individuation and the role that dreams play in working through that process. We've also looked at some specific techniques for interpreting dreams from a Jungian perspective. And this is all very much condensed, but it kind of gives you a sense of where we hope to go in the, uh, in the course. As I say, there's much more uh, to both the theory and the technique of Jungian dream work. Jung wrote volumes and volumes on dreams and held many seminars. The notes of many of these seminars have been published and are available. Much of his work with myth, alchemy, fairy tales, etc., as I've just said, was with the aim of helping him to amplify dream images and symbols. So there's lots more uh, to do. Much of this work, again, not everything, but a lot of it we will do our best to cover and discuss in our eight-week course on Jungian dreams. If you do decide to enroll in the Jungian Dreams course, you can simply audit the course by attending 
the live weekly broadcasts, or you can watch the video of each class uh, at your convenience. It'll be hosted in the course uh, learning platform that we use Haiku, the Haiku learning platform. And along with that will be additional resources, articles, and videos, and uh, as well as opportunities for further discussions with your classmates. And that's just if you just want to audit and just want to have fun and learn as much as you can, uh, lots of resources will be available. Also, if you choose to earn a certificate for completion of the course, you can follow along on the learning platform and complete the assignments. Our course, we will have a course textbook, which will you'll need to read in order to uh, do well on the uh, quizzes. There's going to be four, basically four quizzes. Um, the textbook is Dreams, A Portal to the Source by Edward Whitmont and Sylvia Brinton Pereira, an excellent book that's used as a textbook for training union analysts. And uh, you really can't do better than that one. Uh, the hall by is toss up between that and the hall book, and there are other books that are excellent. Uh, certainly Jung's writings are excellent, but um, I, I think this uh, Dream Sports of the Source, uh, you'll find this very, very, very useful. And even if you don't take the course, I highly recommend that you get that book and, and uh, look at it if you are interested in dream interpretation. So I'm going to quickly just run through the modules. The first module is going to be a history of dream interpretation. Jung himself spent a lot of time on this, and there's a lot of other resources. And this module will talk about the history of dream interpretation in human culture and see how ancient practices compare to Jung's use of dreams and dream interpretation. The earliest known recorded use of dream interpretation can be found in what is generally regarded as the oldest existing human literature, which is the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh. Since that time, there have been countless examples of dream interpretation recorded in ancient texts, usually in a religious context. So it's, uh, it's, it's astounding to me that uh, literally the first, the first, sur the oldest surviving text that we have of any kind uh, includes, uh, and central to the storyline is dream interpretation. For a Jungian, the religious context is extremely important because it suggests the presence of archetypal patterns that were recorded in these ancient documents and points to, uh, to that phenomenon. So the science of dreams is going to be module two, and we'll look at what neuroscientists and biologists and others uh, have to say about dreams and how that sort of corresponds to Jung's theory. It's remarkable, given Jung's fidelity to the method of introspection, that in the years since his death, neuroscientific inquiries have repeatedly supported his early findings. Not everything, but many of the things that he postulated have now been shown to be true. Uh, often the neuroscience is just, well, they always use a different approach, but they also use different terminology. And uh, even so, their discoveries can be easily correlated by sympathetic unions to Jung's early work. So module three, we're going to talk about, we're going to get right into Jung's writings. He had many, many writings um, throughout his lifetime. He wrote countless essays, conducted seminars, and discussed the importance of dreams and dream interpretation throughout his work and in practically any random Jungian writing you pick up, you'll, you'll find some discussion of, of dreams of some type, some type or other. Some of these essays that we'll discuss are dreams and psychic energy, the practical use of dream analysis, individual dream symbolism in relation to alchemy, dream interpretation, ancient and modern, dream analysis, notes on, on the seminar from 1928 to 1930, and seminar on children's dreams and more. There's really countless writings. We won't be able to go into depth on all of them, but we will uh, review them, summarize them. Part of the idea of this course is based on uh, sort of the graduate level, uh, gra graduate uh, way of learning and teaching, which is to make a broad array of materials available, and then the student chooses the one that really focuses on uh, their interests, and from that can you know, has the resources, uh, has been exposed to resources that can then be used for further research. So then module four will go into a lot of detail on Jung's, uh, the different way he interpreted dreams. We'll look at a lot of dreams, his own dreams that he interpreted, and the dreams of others that he interpreted. Uh, according to his own account, he's interpreted thousands and thousands of dreams. Many of them are uh, documented in his work. 
he did not like to systemize his work, as we said, but even so he has, uh, and he and his students have both left a number of clues as to how to get a foothold in the slippery world of dream interpretation, always keeping in mind the goal of supporting and furthering the individuation process. And if, if you only take away one thing from this class, I hope it's that you understand that for Jung, the real purpose of dream interpretation, all the techniques, all the amplifications, all the methods is simply to build and maintain that ego self axis, which is the hallmark of the individuation process, this communication between the ego and the deep unconscious. That's how we uh, come enlivened with life energies that we can use generatively uh, for the people we love, for our community and for the world, hopefully. So uh, module five, we'll talk about that very process of amplification, dreams and mythology. That's, that's kind of a very much a uh, Reader's Digest uh, title there because there's a lot more than simply mythology covers all these areas of fairy tales, religious ideas, and many, many other cultural artifacts. Jung saw all these parallels because, why? Because all these artifacts were created by human beings and the structures of the unconscious Jung felt were projected into these cultural artifacts and through them we get insights not only into the structure of the psyche but insights into specific dreams specific dream images and helps us with specific cases of individuation that may be stuck uh, the dream inevitably gives us great uh, hints so we're going to go into uh, amplification and uh, see how amplified images, amplified uh, dreams, dream images and patterns can be paralleled with uh, myths and fairy tales and what have you to open up the energy that's encased in these symbols that we find in the dream. Module six, we're gonna talk about dreams and trauma. Not all nightmares are indicative of trauma, but nightmares do carry a special significance, and most trauma survivors do report disturbing and frightening dreams that seem to carry powerful energy and special urgency. So in this module, we'll look at how historical patterns of trauma may appear in dreams and how Jung understood nightmares. We'll also consider some of the ideas of other Jungians, especially Donald Kalshid, who has some wonderful ways of working with trauma. And we'll try to understand the importance of the dream images that relate to trauma, whether they be actual nightmares or just repetitive patterns that indicate the uh, emergence of traumatic uh, memories and patterns. Module seven, we're going to talk about an array of different depth psychology interpretation methods. Since Jung's death in 1961, many Jungians and other depth psychologists have proposed a variety of different dream interpretation methods and techniques. And in this module, we're going to look at some of the approaches to dream work that have been employed in an effort to expand upon Jung's ideas while still remaining true to his theory. Of uh, special interest to us will be the ideas of Marie Louise von Franz, the great uh, Jungian Robert Johnson, who recently passed away, Anthony Stevens, one of my favorites, Stephen Eisenstadt and his dream tending, and Jeremy Taylor, who emphasized uh, doing dream work in groups, which is uh, not something that Jung usually did, although he did work with big seminars and people where they would talk about dreams, but uh, group dream work is a wonderful thing too. So finally, module eight, we're going to look at big dreams or dreams and culture. In the final module, we look at dreams that express what Jung called the archetypal level of consciousness. These so-called big dreams have been recognized by people throughout history as having special cultural significance. These big dreams affect the individual and group psyche so profoundly that they are understood to have significance for many, many people, not just one individual. Big dreams are typically understood to have religious significance and have been recorded in some of the earliest religious scriptures. We'll look at Jung's ideas about big dreams as well as some recent scholarship, which I find really fascinating uh, in the field of religious studies uh, by a scholar named Kelly Bulkley. Uh, he sees in big dreams the roots of the origin of religion and uh, traces uh, the use of dreams in religious practice. And he's, got, he's actually got, I think, four or five different books on dreams and religious phenomena, which he seems highly influenced by Jung. He's another one of these people who does not mention Jung much by name. But <clears throat> again, 
uh, when we're talking about religious patterns, for Jung, uh, archetypes were always experienced subjectively as being numinous, and numinous is the word coined by theologian Rudolf Otto to describe religious experience. So when we talk about religion, religious experience, and these big dreams, we're necessarily zeroing in on uh, what Jung identified as being archetypes. And that's how we will close the course. I hope this has been helpful for you all, uh, if it's been helpful at all to anybody. If anybody, even one person, goes uh, home tonight and wakes up in the morning and writes down their dream, then I will have helped to further the uh, mission of the Deaf Psychology Alliance. Of course, I hope that you will consider registering for the course, uh, Union Dreams course. And now I hope there's still people uh, out there. Uh, I haven't really looked at that. 42. 42, holy mackerel. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, immediately looked at the chat. It says, does James provide a syllabus of the course? We can take notes along with the notes. And as a matter of fact, if you go to the Deaf Psychology Alliance, um, there's, and you click on the little ad on the right, it'll take you to a page, which I recently added a link uh, a couple times throughout the page. You'll find a link where you can download the syllabus. So the syllabus is available. Uh, you can also uh, email me directly and I'll, you know, I'll send you a copy of the syllabus. Happy to. Um, but yeah, uh, Jeremy, you got any questions ready for me? Um, we have some people wanting to switch from um, auditing to the certification. How do we need to go about that? Um, well, the, the you mean switch? Have they signed? You mean they signed up for the course or they? Yeah, uh, they believe they signed. Darrell, I believe. Good to see you, Darrell. By the way, um, she said she signed up to audit, but she wants to switch to the certification. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, the, here's the thing. The people who have taken the course so far, if you've taken, uh, in other words, you've taken uh, Jung 101, Jung 102, and you got a certificate, that certificate will not only uh, be used towards the certification, but will um, also allow you, when I put it online on the video on demand, Everybody who's got a certificate will automatically have free access to all those videos. Uh, if you have not yet done any of those and you've signed up for the Jung and Dreams course, then yeah, that you just need to complete the, uh, you know, we'll, as we start the course next week, just talk to me and, and we will um, make sure that you, you just, it's, it's not that onerous. You need to do some uh, discussions every week. Every other week, there's a little quiz. You need to keep up with the reading or you won't do well in the quiz. You only need to get 80%. You need to have an 80% average at the end of the course. There's a, uh, you have to present a, uh, d submit a thesis statement and for your paper and then do a final paper and there'll be a little final exam. Um, so there may be one or two other assignments, but basically just as long as you keep up with the reading and you attend the classes or re or see the video afterwards, you'll have no trouble getting the certificate. And then if you, if there are the other classes that you haven't done yet, uh, hopefully my goal is to get them all online as soon as we can, as soon as it's humanly possible for me. And you'll be able to get the certificate uh, for each of those classes that way. And when you've got all eight, then you automatically have the certification. Is the haiku side up and running already? Or are we good to go there? Well, here's the thing with, with haiku, what I used to do, was, uh, as you might remember, Jeremy, I would have it. It, it. it is up and it's ready to go, but I used to make it available. Um, I used to make the first module available on the Monday following the intro class. But then people would sign up late. And then, in other words, the first module would start. The Saturday of the first module would be the first lecture or the first class. Now, because so many people see the sign up later, they get behind, they're, they're confused, they didn't understand how to use Heiko. What I'm doing now is after the Saturday first module talk, which will be next Saturday, that following Monday, module one will be open on Heiko. That way everybody's on the same page, everybody can download things. The, I will put up uh, this on the, on the very first... Uh, um, yeah, I will communicate with all the people who have registered for the class, and I'll make this lecture available on Haiku as well as on, on the uh, Deaf Psychology site. And But you won't have access to Module 1. It's kind of a Module 0, you know, uh, you'll have access to that. Start here, it says, I think, something like that. Uh, module 1, you won't have access to till a week from Monday. 
but then yeah everything will be open then. it's it's up and ready to go but i don't have all the module one stuff loaded yet because like i said that way people who sign up some people won't sign up until the the day before the first class in which case they're going to be way behind everybody so start i think starting with the alchemy class i started doing it that way Okay. And Rosin had said she wants to, or he wants to enroll, but won't be able to make the 1 p.m. Saturday lectures every week. And I think mm -hmm. that we put the replays up on Haiku, so that shouldn't really be a big, big deal, right? That shouldn't be a big deal. And I'm committed now. I mean, I've always said, uh, I've always given people the sort of the caveat, well, if as long as uh, technology cooperates, I'll do it. Well, even if technology doesn't cooperate, if for some reason it crashes, I will, I'm committed to re-recording the claim, just be me, there won't be questions and things, but I'll re-record the lecture so that there will always be, uh, all eight lectures will be up there. Excellent. So, so you will always touch wood, uh, or this is particle board, but anyways, uh, touch uh, wood, uh, I will, uh, it's my commitment to make sure everybody is able to access it, whether they can make the 1 p.m. class or not. Excellent. Did I miss anybody? There was a lot of questions. I'm afraid I'm, maybe I missed somebody. If I did, feel free to unmute and share video, ask um, if you have any questions. Yeah, please. Uh, don't uh, be shy about uh, unmuting as well. I mean, I've so far just been answering questions about the course, which I'm very happy to do. I want to encourage everybody to be interested and to sign up, of course. But uh, but it, the material is pretty dense. And if you have questions just about uh, what we've been talking about, please. Um, yeah, and uh, we just had Jennifer say I, 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 she doesn't need a certification, but also wants to fully participate, have access to all the discussions. Beyond quizzes, would she miss anything from just auditing? I don't think so. Uh, well, the, the main thing that you would miss that some people have really have reported they really like, which is the, just um, the discussion board every week is an opportunity to just share, uh, you know, talk with people on the site. You can, you can share each other's email address or you can just, uh, you, you, there's many ways to do it, but there's usually compelling uh, discussions and ways it's, it's sort of keeps people focused, keeps people wanting to read more, <coughs> excuse me, wanting to read more. We wanted to talk about the materials. <clears throat> so that's what you would miss if you didn't do the discussion boards. Um, <clears throat> other than that, there's a paper if you like writing papers. Um, Rosin asked, um, are the quizzes taking place in real time at a given time? <clears throat> they can access them at different times in the week. Yeah, I encourage people to do them in the week that they're assigned just because, um, you know, it, it, a lot of people say, oh, I'll just wait, I'll just wait, and then it becomes very hard. I, I, I do draw the line that, you know, a couple weeks after the course is over, I don't want to keep people going for months and months saying, Oh, I'm going to finish that. I'm, I mean, I do let people, I know things come up, but depending on how many people actually go for the certificate, if I've got a bunch of people, I got to grade all these papers, it gets very confusing. And I've got other, you know, I teach uh, many classes online, so it gets uh, a little hairy, but yeah, you, you don't have to be, you don't, there's no, there's no real deadlines. Um, one early in the process, I used to make the final exam and the final paper due in the last module, and people complained saying that's too much to have to do all at once. So now the final paper is due in module seven, and about half of the people didn't turn in the paper till module eight anyway. So you know I don't really mind it, and some people wouldn't turn it until a week after. That you know I'm not real stickler about that. I really want people to be engaged. I want people to learn. I want people to get the certificate. Uh, I'm not trying to make it hard. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to get people that the main thing for me is to get people so excited about it that, uh, that they're learning. You're not going to, this is not something that you, that you can just have a mind dump and, and, and you learn this stuff. Right. You really have to be engaged. And if you're, you know, if you're really working on your own stuff and, and, and love this work, then it just comes naturally. And so I'm not trying to make it hard for people. I'm trying to make it uh, work for people. That's great. And Anne said she has um, a dream group. She's going to be hosting here a woman's dream group, and it'll uh, cohere with the class process. Great. Just Anne. Oh, this Anne Amberg. Hey, Anne. Great. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? 
Hi, James and Jeremy. I'll just Hi. say real quick, it's great to be with you all sure. again. Um, I'm not actually hosting it, but I'm participating in it with a, a close group of women friends who I've known for a long time. And um, I, I'm really excited about the timing, actually. I think it's yeah. going to be real support, as I do find, like many people, that when I'm doing these depth psychology classes that my inner work comes up to do, and it's always been really fruitful for me. Um, I, find well, that I, you know, I do a lot of active imagination work too, so that really helps me to move through the material on my own. But, but I think it'll be interesting to see how our group works with this too. So Anne is a uh, is a model student, just so you all know. Um, love to have you back, Anne. And please, Anne, tell people: is this class is, is it worthwhile for you? You're saying you help stimulate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just put a oh, comment in the chat. chat. But oh, um, I just really, it works really well for me. I can do my work at home. I can, I love the online discussion boards and the interesting diversity of people who are participating and the discussions we get into are phenomenal. I mean, you just want to go on and on with it. So I, I love all the resources that, that you provide, James, and I just learned so much and I'm, you know, it, it, it works with my schedule. Um, so I highly recommend it. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. I, you know, somehow <laughs> I knew you would say that. That's <laughs> my pleasant. pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and Anne has been with us from the beginning. She's a wonderful person, great student. So Thanks, you will James. enjoy. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> please, Rachel McRoberts. Hi, how are you? Green Group in Nashville. I lived in Nashville. Rachel's an old friend of my wife's. And uh, oh, and by the way, Rachel, um, I don't know if you heard earlier, I was saying uh, Zoe uh, almost got run over. She managed to get out of the way, but she fell and broke her leg. She now has a couple pins and screws in her leg and she's uh, recovering. I know you'd want to know about that. Um, Thank there you. Was, there was, um, yes, I hope, prayers. Um, I hope, where was it? Uh, Facebook group. That's the question. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, uh, face, yeah, that's not something I'm able to do. Um, I can manage it. There's people requ requesting it. Yeah, there is. There is. I mean, I know there was. We, I think we had a Facebook group for one of the other classes, didn't we? One of the, I think the first class, yeah. Yeah, and then that ended up, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, if Jeremy, uh, stay in touch with Jeremy. Uh, he will be here uh, next week, and, um, you know, he'll let you know what's going on in the Facebook group because that's not something yeah. that I'm very adept at. Although I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook, I'm just not real adept at it. I'll put a URL in the, in the chat next week so we can all join. Great. So there will be a Facebook group per Jeremy. That's it. Thanks, Jeremy. You got it. So any other thoughts, questions? Mm, I don't see any ideas. Feel free to unmute. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for the focus. Very appreciated. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm speaking to you from Nayarit in Mexico, where I live. and uh, Where in Mexico? Uh, it, actually, it, on the coast, about an hour our uh, north of Puerto Vallarta. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, and there's a few. There's a few of us. One lady who I sent. I forwarded your email and the announcement of the classes, and then you guys had to run for your lives uh, when the hurricane was coming along. But, yeah. Uh, speaking of mythos, but um, uh, she'll be connecting, I'm sure, later because we do quite a lot of dream work in this area again with a small group of mm -hmm. real invested dreamers <laughs> yeah well once yeah. you once you start doing the work it really is so uh so rewarding that uh, yeah it's easy to be invested oh well, thank gosh. you thanks for sharing yeah i i have dream journals going back to the 60s and and it's a uh, home ground wow. for me to keep uh, seeing the beautiful parallels that you don't realize till later unless you read back and you say oh there's that image again and oh there's the garden full of uh writing implements and there's the you know it's, yeah. it's really great. So I appreciate your focus and your, and also making this accessible the, at that college level. It would certainly be hard to do out here in the jungle, but it's really extraordinary. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's one of our goals is that uh, the thing is there's, there's so many people that are not living uh, near the West Coast where all the Jungian schools are and are not near. Yeah. Uh, oops, somebody is screen sharing there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, um, the uh, work is is extremely rewarding and, and well. Uh, it it's easy. It's it's easy to to do on in one sense. Another sense, it's uh, it's it's no joke. It uh, can really trigger things, and it it takes a certain amount of commitment. A lot of times, we'll 
work on a little bit and such powerful things will come up that it'll be a, a while before we get back to it. But well, uh, the, synchronicity, the synchronicities are so striking. I, I'm actually by profession an astrologer for 40 years. And uh -huh. uh, when I read uh, Jung's version of that, his uh, unique uh, noting of the so-called compatibility factor between um, a long-term couple that still likes each other after, after 30 years. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was an interesting observation of that dance of the sun and moon between uh, and the synchrony, synchronicities that get you on your knees from the, uh, you know, the recognition of how interconnected and profound this whole, uh, I love, I love your addressing of this, that we are, you know, that the archetype assumes the responsibility for the weight of it. And, and I have to say, even though I, I probably was guilty in the eighties of something similar to claim that I, I've, I've been a little dismayed, you know, women claiming to be the goddess. And it's like, no, sweetie, it would crush you. You, you can't do that. You yeah, do. exactly. No, that, that you is just true. Enjoy <laughs> just being part of the big body. So, yeah. yeah. And, and as long as we know, yeah, you are the goddess and I am the goddess. As long as I know that I'm uh, yeah. humbly in relation to that energy, not uh, right. owning it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's an interesting area though. Thank you so much for that. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, any idea how to, uh, who's sharing their screen there, Jeremy? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what I was going to what kind of will impact on the video, but in any case, um, yeah, we are, uh, oh, there it is. Got it. We're coming up to the end of, uh, an hour and a half and I'm happy to go as long as anybody wants, uh, now, someone asked about the, uh, that Olga says, um, the title of the book again is Dreams, A Portal to the Source. That is exactly right. It's uh, husband and wife team authors, uh, Edward Whitmont and Sylvia Brinton Pereira. It's not inexpensive. You can sometimes find it used uh, at a relatively reasonable price. It's available now. It used to only be available on uh, Google Books as in uh, – as a digital book, but now it's available on Kindle as well as a digital book, but it's like $35. So it's not a, it's not a cheap book, but it's a very, very good. As I say, it's, it's been used for many years as a textbook for uh, union analysts and uh, you really can't beat it. Oh, thank you for that recommendation. Thank you. Sure. I did want to put out this uh, link here, this YouTube link. We were talking about people who um, use young and ideas and, Sometimes I don't think this guy even knows he's using it, or maybe he does. He just doesn't give him credit. But this link right here is to a guy named Dr. Haight, mm -hmm. uh, Haight maybe. And mm -hmm. man, this this really hit me. Uh, he talks about the mind's not a blank slate, and he puts up mm -hmm. he has something called the moral equalizer that we all have. Mm -hmm. Five different ways that we're kind of EQ'd when we come into the world. Yeah, yeah, and it's it just hit me. I I found it the other day, and it's completely young in. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of that. Uh, if you read um, another great book, for we'll talk about this in uh, one of the, and I'm going to draw on it a lot for the course. Uh, Anthony Stevens, who I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of, uh, has a book called Private Myths, Dreams, and Dreaming, mm -hmm. and he uh, he is expert at correlating, particularly scientific research. That basically is another way, of, and this guy I mentioned also, it's, uh, he's, he's later than, than uh, Anthony Stevens' writings, but this guy, Kelly Buckley, who is a religious studies person who is interested in dreams, he talks about, um, uh, what does he call it, something like uh, pattern, dream pattern, that kind of thing. But th there are all these different people, scientists and other people who use all kinds of uh, like uh, innate response mechanisms. That's one of the things that the, the ethologists say, but there are these different scientific terms that they use and they're clearly talking about exactly what uh, Jung is talking about, but they're just, they're trying to make it accessible and I'm all for it. They're trying to make it acceptable right. to uh, scientific communities and to people who would not listen to Jung for a moment. So I'm, I'm glad it's out there. The, um, the scientific community is uh, it, there's plenty now of scientific research for things that for, for my money are identical to what Jung is calling archetypes. Exactly. people the, what they really rebel against is the introspective technique the fact that Jung, 100 years ago came up with these same 
uh, ideas, but did it through introspection and through dream analysis and through the analysis of myth and archetype. And uh, it infuriates uh, scientists that he was right, but uh, <laughs> sorry about that. And he's not an easy read. I think that's the other thing. Exactly, yeah. And it, that's why reading some of his, the people that came after him, really clears things up. And Absolutely. And go back to him. You know, yeah, I, and Jung, oh, yeah, and Jung, yeah, and Jung, which is I think, another reason for these courses. And and Jung himself uh, says that if you look at the introduction that he wrote for Eric Neumann's yeah. Origins and History of Consciousness, he says, uh, you know, this is the lot of the pioneer who kind of yeah digs through, you know, the archaeology, does all the archaeological work, and then it's up to someone else to kind of codify that down into a, something systemized or systematic, or something that's at least more easily uh, grasped oh. and that's again that's why he didn't want he was always updating and changing his theory too i think uh, a lot of people who get stuck i mean I'm, I'm very much a classical jungian but people get stuck in exactly what jung said whereas if you actually read jung you'd realize that if he had available to him uh warren coleman is someone like that warren coleman is a jungian a british jungian who's recently come up with a book called acted image and he's up on the modern science and he's sort of updating uh, how we understand archetype. He's even kind of more modern than Anthony Stevens. Mm. But uh, but however we identify these things, uh, it's it's uh, it's nice to know that they're you know the research is still going on and it is being. Although people have been trying to bury Jung for a long time, he's outliving uh, all of them. Yeah, the truth <laughs> comes out. I believe. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I'm going to have to, uh, unless we have burning questions, I'm happy to jump in, but we're going to need to uh, call today. Say thank you all very, very much for joining us. I hope to see you on the class. And if not, uh, we'll see you next time on the Depth Psychology Alliance. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, everybody. Thank you again, James. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks.